Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Mark Soleil. Dr. Soleil completed his undergraduate education at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. He earned his Doctor of Medicine degree with honours from the University of Toronto in Ontario. He then performed postgraduate training in urology at the University of Ottawa, also in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Soleil is board certified with the American Board of Urology and is certified in urology as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada. Dr. Soleil currently practices medicine with Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. As you can see, today we're going to be talking about prostate health and uh, prostate cancer. So that includes uh, prostate cancer screening and some of the controversy that is out there recently uh, that you may have heard about in the papers or in the media about prostate cancer screening using uh, PSA. And I'll explain that in more detail later. So we're going to start off the session talking about prostate anatomy, where the prostate is, what it does. We're also going to talk about BPH or benign enlargement of the prostate that affects many men. And then we'll talk about prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening. So what is a prostate? It's this walnut-sized organ that sits at the base of the bladder. There's your bladder. That's a prostate. The seminal vesicles are also right behind the prostate, and they're involved in sexual function, releasing a lot of the fluid that comes out in the ejaculate. The urethra that carries the urine out of the bladder runs right through the prostate and then out through the, the, re the remainder of the lower urinary tract. And that is why that prostate enlargement can affect urinary function in so many ways. So BPH, what is it? It stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Many people call it hypertrophy, but it really is a hyperplasia. The difference is in whether the cells get bigger, which is hypertrophy, versus hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of cells uh, in the prostate, which is what actually happens on a pathological level. So the prostate continues to enlarge throughout life and by multiplying the number of cells. That enlargement affects most men at some point in their life, uh, and that's genetically determined. It's obviously more common with age. As men get older, the prostate gets larger and larger and causes more symptoms. And it can affect the urination and also the quality of life as a result of those urination problems. On the left here, you can see a normal bladder. This is normal bladder thickness. The urethra is going through the prostate. And this is a normal prostate with the urethra wide open. It's not, the, the flow of the urine is not restricted. This is BPH. So this is an enlarged prostate. As the prostate enlarges outwardly, it also enlarges inwardly and constricts the urethra. There's a difference in the, in the lumen or the size of the urethra. That causes the pressure inside the bladder to go up. The bladder has to work harder to generate that same urinary stream that it used to, or even anything close to that. Now, just like any other muscle in the body, resistance causes the muscle to get thicker and bigger. So when you're working out and you're lifting weights, your biceps will get bigger as a result. That's the whole idea. That's a good thing for a skeletal muscle, and it's not a good thing for an internal organ like the bladder, because it's going to produce some of the symptoms that we're going to talk about later. Again, as the prostate enlarges, it constricts the urinary tract and the urethra, causing the symptoms. This is 
not intuitive, but the actual size of the prostate doesn't always correlate with the symptoms. The reason is that the prostate may enlarge in different ways. So if the prostate enlarges mostly inwardly, even a, a small amount of enlargement can cause significant symptoms. Some men with really large prostate may still have a, a rather open urethra, and the symptoms may not be as bad. So the physical exam, the size of the prostate doesn't always correlate, and that surprises some men, but that's the explanation. So some stats about BPH, it affects more than 26 million men each year in the United States. The prostate grows to a normal size by the time you reach puberty, complete puberty, and that's about the size of a walnut. It usually weighs about 18 to 20 grams at that time. It continues to grow, stimulated by testosterone, throughout life. How fast it grows is genetically determined. So some men will have problems in their 40s and 50s. Some men may not have any symptoms until their 70s or 80s. But basically, every man is going to have a problem with their enlarged prostate to some degree. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms are either caused by obstruction to the flow, so a weak flow, or by the irritative symptoms that the bladder may experience because of the obstruction and that hypertrophy or that thickening of the bladder wall. And it could include a weak stream, feelings of incomplete emptying, frequent trips to the bathroom during the daytime and nighttime, actual incomplete emptying and an elevated residual in the urine, and in what we call intermittency or stopping and going or feeling like you have to do double voiding to complete your urination. The consequences of BPH include the symptoms that we just talked about. And the acronym that we use in urology is LUTS, or Lower Urinary Tract Symptoms. But it can also lead to either acute or chronic urinary retention. Acute retention is in somebody who is just getting by. The prostate is causing obstruction, and the bladder is compensating, but barely. And then something happens. Maybe they take an over-the-counter medication, like a cold medication, that causes constriction of the, the smooth muscle in the bladder neck or they um, have an infection, prostatitis or inflammation, that causes that swelling to finally shut down the urethra, and then they suddenly can't urinate. The bladder gets really full very quickly, and that's a very painful condition that requires an emergency insertion of a Foley catheter. Chronic retention is more of a slow, gradual enlargement of the bladder with an ever-increasing residual in the bladder that eventually can cause serious problems like kidney failure, because if it happens silently, and we used to see this a lot more before people had regular medical care, the bladder gets bigger and bigger silently because it is a gradual process, so it's not painful. That pressure builds up and backs up into the ureters and then into the kidneys, and then the kidneys can't filter anymore against that pressure, so you get kidney failure and renal failure. Detrusor, the detrusor is the, the name for the uh, bladder muscle. Detrusor instability or an overactive bladder results because of that hypertrophy, that thickening of the bladder wall that happens because of this increased pressure inside the lumen of the bladder. As the bladder works harder, it gets thicker and then becomes irritable and unstable. So what happens is that the functional capacity of the bladder is reduced. And instead of waiting until it's four or 500 milliliters full of urine before giving you the signal that it has to go, it, it might irritate you and feel like it, you have to avoid at 100 or 200 milliliters. So you obviously go more frequently. Urinary tract infections can occur because of the elevated residual. So even though the bladder is working harder, it's not emptying completely, there's always some urine sitting at the bottom of the bladder. And that acts like a little culture medium that acts to promote infections. And it could also lead to bladder stones as chemicals in the urine precipitate to the bottom of the bladder in that residual. They can form stones that get bigger and bigger. Bleeding can occur from the prostate. The enlarging prostate requires more blood supply, and those bigger blood vessels aren't always normal. They might be close to the surface, they're fragile, um, just straining or even constipation, straining to have a bowel movement can cause some bleeding from the prostate. And that bleeding at times can be quite severe. The blood, as you may have seen in the picture before, the prostate is very close to the bladder and the bleeding ends up going into the bladder and forming blood clots that can cause obstruction out to the flow and cause retention. So as we mentioned before, the prevalence or the percentage of men that have BPH increases with age. And so do the symptoms that, that go along with that. So for example, 
in people under 49, nocturia or getting up at night is less than 5% or in that range. But in an 80-year-old, 70 to 80% of men will have nocturia. They will have to get up at least once at night to urinate as a result of this obstruction. And that goes along with the other symptoms, the weak stream, the urgency, and the frequency as well. So what kind of impact does this have on men? It impacts the quality of life as a direct result of those symptoms. If you're getting up every one or two hours to urinate, you're not getting enough sleep. Some men can't go back to sleep. They're chronically tired. They're sleepy during the daytime. They don't like going places where there's no bathroom or where they're not close to a bathroom, where they don't know where all the bathrooms are. It limits their activities. And it may limit outdoor sports. You might not want to go golfing with your friends if you're the only one that has to run to the bathroom every hour. So you have BPH. What are your treatment options? The slide is a little busy, but just to we'll summarize it quickly, watchful waiting or doing nothing is a valid option for most men. Basically, if there are no complications of BPH, the serious complications, the infections, the stone, the hematuria, the retention, then what determines the need to intervene is the patient and the patient's symptoms and how the symptoms are impacting their life. So if the symptoms are mild and the patient can live with them, then we live with them and we don't do anything. We just keep an eye on it and monitor on an annual or semi-annual basis. If they are bothered and the symptoms are relatively mild, we consider medications. Two large categories of medications are the alpha blockers and the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. The alpha blockers, such as Flomax or Tamsulosin, Hytrin, Cardura, Uroxetrol, Rapaflow, they all work by the same mechanism. They relax the smooth muscle in the bladder, neck, and in the prostate. The prostate is a gland that produces fluid, but it also has smooth muscle that surrounds the outside and within the gland itself. And as the prostate enlarges, that smooth muscle tone increases and causes a functional obstruction of the urethra. So as well as the fixed obstruction you have from the enlargement, the tight prostate causes obstruction that can be relaxed almost immediately by alpha blockers. So you see the effect of those medications very quickly when you take them. The 5 alpha reductase inhibitors actually cause a decrease in the size of the prostate over time. And they act by inhibiting the effect of testosterone on the prostate. Testosterone doesn't act on the prostate directly. It has to be converted to another similar hormone by the uh, enzyme 5 alpha reductase. If you inhibit that enzyme, you inhibit the effect of testosterone on the prostate without changing the testosterone level in the serum. They're usually indicated for people with enlarged prostates above, say, about 50 grams, and whose symptoms are not relieved by the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors alone. So you often use them in combination. For somebody who has more severe symptoms or maybe can't tolerate the medications or doesn't want to take medications the rest of their lives, you can go to the minimally, minimally invasive therapies, such as TUMT or the transurethral microwave therapy. There is also TUNA or transurethral needle ablation. These are basically in-office procedures that involve heating the prostate by either putting a catheter in the, the urethra that is situated at the prostate. And with something like microwaves, you heat the tissue. And if you have ever cooked a steak, you see that the steak shrinks when it hits the heat. So a lot of things, the proteins shrink with heat. So you're basically cooking the prostate and shrinking it. And that causes it to separate away from the urethra and it opens up the urethra. That can work for some men and it is relatively temporary. After a few years, the symptoms are going to return and you may need another procedure at that stage. For more definitive treatment and for more permanent treatment, you usually have to go to the more invasive procedures such as the laser, photoselective vaporization or the green light or the transurethral resection of the prostate, the TERP or the rotorooter is another name for it. That is a gold standard and that gives you the best results. An open prostatectomy where you actually have to make an incision and remove the bulk of the prostate is done in really re large prostates that may not be safely done with the minimally invasive or the mildly invasive procedures. This is an example of the result you might get uh, with surgery. This is the view I have when I do a scope when I look through the urethra and I put the cystoscope through the urethra and I get to the prostate, this is the right side of the, the, the right lobe, that's the left lobe, and in the middle is the middle lobe. 
And that tiny little dark area is the urethra. That's the only tract that's open right now for the urine to flow through. Immediately after the surgery, with the laser or with the TERP, all this tissue is removed and all this black area is a wide open channel for the urination. You actually have to cut through the urethra. There's no way to get to the prostate tissue without doing that. So what you have is a raw surface here that after a few weeks or a couple of months will get lined up again by the transitional epithelium that's found in the bladder and in the urethra. Once that happens, a lot of the symptoms that you might experience after the surgery are relieved. And those will include some burning, a little bit of blood in the urine, some frequency. And then you have a wide open channel and the urinary stream is excellent at that stage. And it's usually a pretty permanent result. So prostate cancer screening. Prostate, bladder, this is the rectum, and this is how a digital rectal exam is done. The prostate is sitting on the rectum. So you can't obviously see it. And a lot of people ask me, well, do I need to do this? If I've just had a colonoscopy for colon cancer. When the gastroenterologist is doing a colonoscopy, he's looking at the lining of the colon and the rectum for polyps. He can't see the prostate and cannot rule out prostate cancer. Finger exam can feel the back end of the prostate, the posterior end, that can tell us if there's a nodule, a bump, an irregularity that might be suspicious for cancer. Before the advent of PSA testing, this was the only way to test for prostate cancer. And so it had to be advanced enough, it had to be large enough for you to feel it before you could determine whether somebody had the disease or not. Now we use PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, which is a blood test that we'll talk about in more detail soon. There's a digital rectal exam, and it's usually a combination of the two tests. If you have an abnormal exam or an elevated PSA, that's usually an indication to be sent to a urologist for further testing, and that often involves a biopsy if the findings are confirmed. That's really the only way to tell whether there is cancer or there isn't. The physical exam and the PSA act only as a guide. Prostate cancer is very common. Many famous men have been diagnosed with it and have been successfully treated. So what is it? Like any cancer, prostate cancer is an abnormal cell growth. It often begins with one cell that has a genetic abnormality. It might have been genetically abnormal to begin with, and then usually there's an environmental hit, some, some chemical or some stress in the environment cause another genetic change, a break in the chromosome, a change in the DNA. So what happens is that the, the cell, that particular cell, doesn't follow the normal rules. Every cell has a rule that when you grow to a certain size or when you meet other cells nearby, you stop growing or you grow at a slower rate. Prostate cancer cells, any cancer cells don't obey those rules and they continue to grow. The other thing that they can do when they become really aggressive or de-differentiated or high grade is they actually can break away completely and can float around in the uh, lymphatic system or in the bloodstream and can land in another organ and can survive in that organ, which is a really unusual thing for a cell to do. Most cells in the body cannot do that. They cannot survive outside their own organ. And that's the danger of cancer. Prostate cancer most of the time has no symptoms. A very common question I get from men is, do I need to be screened? Do I need the biopsy? I feel fine. I don't have any symptoms. Why do I need this? Well, the problem is prostate cancer doesn't have any symptoms until it gets to be advanced and probably too late to treat it at that point. So you want to get it at the time, at the point in your life when it is small, and when it is asymptomatic. It can cause symptoms, such as back pain, bleeding, obstruction, but only when it's advanced. Some facts about prostate cancer. It's the most commonly diagnosed non-skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, skin cancers are pretty common. But in, in terms of internal organs, it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death after lung cancer. The third is colon cancer in men. And the best prognosis is when it's detected early and it's localized to the prostate, of course. These, again, are busy slides, but we'll just briefly talk about the staging of prostate cancer. T 
stands for tumor. The current staging mechanism is a TNM staging, T for tumor, N for uh, lymph nodes, and M for metastases. So T refers to the disease as it, as it is in the organ itself. T1 means it's very, very early on. It's often just microscopic. You can't feel it on physical exam. So the rectal exam will be normal in this case. And it's either detected because of an elevated PSA, which would be what we call a T1C, or somebody with an enlarged prostate and a normal PSA undergoes a TERP. You do a resection, and then the pathologist examines that tissue and finds prostate cancer as an incidental finding. And that would still be a T1 cancer. T2 means that it's large enough that it can be felt. On the rectal exam, you could feel a nodularity, a bump, a lump, something irregular on the surface of the prostate that might clue you in that there is a cancer. And obviously, that's a higher stage because it's usually a bigger cancer in that case. T3 is even bigger. It's going outside the capsule of the prostate. It can feel really irregular and rough. It might be invading the seminal vesicles in the back or advancing through the front of the prostate. And T4 is the biggest stage, the biggest local stage. And that's where it's invading the bladder. It might be going into the bones or the muscles of the pelvic sidewall nearby. Not included here is the N staging. That's the lymph nodes. If you have a positive lymph nodes and you have an N1 or an N2 disease, and if it goes to the bone or other organs in the body, the liver or the lung, then you have an M1 disease. That means you have metastases. And that's really advanced disease, obviously. That's not curable. So what are the treatment options? It depends on the stage of the disease, whether it's localized or not. Well, that determines whether it's curable or not. The patient's age and health. Prostate cancer typically will take 10 to 15 years to advance to the point that it will impact your life, whether it will cause symptoms or cause actual death. So somebody with a shorter life expectancy may not want to be treated. In that case, the treatment may actually be worse than the disease. And the personal preference. Some men, even if their, short, their life expectancy is shorter, maybe are not comfortable with the idea that they have cancer in their body and might want something done about it. So it's a personal decision a lot of times, and it has to be done in consultation with your doctor. The options, watchful waiting or observation. That's a reasonable option for patients who are older or sicker and basically have a life expectancy of less than 10 to 15 years. It could also be an, a valid option for somebody with the T1 stage that maybe was detected incidentally on a TERP, the T1A, where you have less than 5% of the specimen that has cancer and it's a low-grade cancer. Even if they're younger and healthier, the chance of that cancer progressing is very low. And again, that's a personal decision that the patient would have to make. If you want to be cured, then you want to consider either surgery, radiation, or cryosurgery, or free freezing the prostate. So surgery involves, it's called a radical prostatectomy. That involves removing the whole prostate. You remove the whole organ, not just d doing a resection like we did with a TERP. And then you put the bladder back together with the urethra. Radiation can be done in two different ways. The traditional or external beam radiation, just like getting an x-ray, the x-rays are shot in from the outside towards the prostate. And what I will often do is I will implant gold seeds in three different locations in the prostate so that the radiation oncologist can do some x-rays before each treatment and can locate those seeds and can triangulate the treatment. And that makes the treatment more accurate and there's less um, incidental uh, radiation of nearby organs. Brachytherapy involves implanting radioactive seeds directly into the prostate. So that's a, a minimally invasive surgical procedure under anesthesia, but the advantage is it's, it's a one-time deal. It's an outpatient procedure. You get the seeds implanted, and the radiation acts on the prostate from the inside out. And after a couple of months or so, all the radiation is gone. You have the seeds in there permanently, but they're no longer radioactive. The external beam radiation usually goes on five days a week for about 43 treatments. So for more than eight weeks, you're going in every day, five days a week, to the radiation center for your treatments. Cryosurgery, and now in some places they have 
heating of the prostate, uh, a procedure called high fu or high intensity focused ultrasound that basically heats the prostate. They're becoming more mainstream. In my mind, I would rather have the radiation or the surgery. They have the longer track records and they have the proven efficacy and safety. But they are becoming more stream as the, the mechanisms, the equipment, and the technique is improved. If you choose surgery, the goal of surgery is, of course, remove the cancer. That's the primary thing. You want to remove the whole organ. You want to remove all the cancer, not leaving any tissue behind. But you also want to preserve the urinary function, and you want to preserve sexual function. So to do that, we do what's called a nerve-sparing prostatectomy. This is the side view. That's the bladder. That's the prostate. This is the urinary sphincter muscle. That's the urethra going through the prostate. And these are the nerves that, the neurovascular bundle that goes to the penis for erectile function. They are literally stuck to the side of the prostate and have to be peeled off on either side. You have to do it very carefully, not using a lot of cautery, not stretching them, not damaging them. Any of those things can cause permanent erectile dysfunction if these are damaged. So you carefully peel those off, you remove the prostate, you preserve the sphincter, and then you reattach the bladder to the sphincter, to the urethra, and you preserve both sexual function and urinary function and control. Okay, so that was prostate cancer. Now, prostate cancer screening. How do we get there? And what you need to know about it. PSA is prostate-specific antigen. It's a protein that's made in the prostate. And what we think it does is it liquefies the, the coagulum of the ejaculate. Most of the fluid that comes out is from the prostate and from the seminal vesicles. A small amount of the fluid is the sperm from the testicles. The fluid has nutrients for the sperm but, and helps carry it uh, through the, the urinary tract, but it is thick. The PSA helps liquefy that liquid to help the, the sperm swim better. We also think that it might actually help dissolve the cervical mucus to help facilitate the, uh, the swimming and the fertility. That's the main function, but as a byproduct, it tends to be released into the bloodstream in very small quantities, in nanogram amounts per milliliter. And that's what we use to screen for prostate cancer. It's a blood test measuring the level of the PSA. Every male that has a prostate has PSA in their bloodstream at a normal amount. Recently, a couple of years ago, the US Preventative Services Task Force came out recommending against PSA-based cancer screening. They did that based on a bunch of studies that they looked at that showed that there's some benefit, but maybe not enough benefit. And if they looked at the cost and benefit analysis, they thought that more harm might be done from the screening than, than the benefit that you're getting out of it. This is questioned by the American Urological Association, by most urologists like myself. To my knowledge, I don't think any urologists were on this panel studying this. Um, and they didn't offer any alternative. So basically, they said, don't screen and take your chances, whether you have cancer or not, which doesn't make sense to, to most of us. Before those guidelines came out, the American Neurological Association used to recommend prostate cancer screening on an annual basis for all men from age 50 to age 75. You start at age 40 for people who are high risk, African American descent, or men with a family member with prostate cancer. Now since then, since last year, the American Neurological Association went back, they revised the guidelines, they looked at the latest studies, they discussed things with the US Preventative Task Force, and these are the new guidelines. This, this is the latest and greatest. So this is a summary, and we're gonna go over it in detail. Men under age 40, the AUA recommends that they do not be screened. They definitively said just don't screen those patients. Between 40 and 54, you might want to, but it's not recommended. It's not as strongly worded. Between age 50 and 69, screening is recommended. Those are the, those are the men that are going to benefit from prostate cancer screening. But instead of annually, if the initial screening is normal, they recommend doing it every two years. For men age 70 or older, or any man, no matter of their age, if their life expectancy is less than 10 to 15 years because of illness or comorbidities, 
Screening is not recommended for those patients either. So we'll go over these in detail now. So under age 40, they have a low prevalence of prostate cancer. Screening has not been shown in any study to have any benefit, and they may have the harms of screening without any significant benefit, so they should not be screened under age 40. Between 40 and 54, it's probably not recommended. It's probably the, the cost-benefit analysis is probably not in favor of screening, except in patients who are high risk. That includes somebody with a first degree relative with prostate cancer, a brother or a father, or African American race because they tend to have a higher grade cancer at presentation, tends to be more aggressive, they might get it earlier in life as well. So they don't say don't do it, it's just not recommended, so it is an individual decision. Somebody who is worried about it because of family history or personal concern about it, et cetera, in discussion with the doctor might decide to get screened after all. For men age 50 to 69, screening is strongly recommended. This is the group of men that's going to have the best results from prostate cancer screening. They're going to have the clinically significant cancers, as we call them. The cancers are actually going to progress and cause symptoms or cause death. They're going to be, their lives are going to be saved from the screening and from early intervention. Depending on how you look at it, for every 1,000 men that are screened, you're going to prevent one death if you, if you follow these men for 14 years. Some studies that follow them for life say that you can prevent as many as six deaths for every 1,000 men that are screened in this age group. And again, this is still a shared decision. Somebody might still decide they don't want to be screened. They don't want to bother with all the, the testing and the biopsies, et cetera. Screen every two years instead of annually. Again, this should be individualized. If your initial screening is normal, you don't have a lot of risk factors, every two years is probably fine. But if the initial screen shows a borderline high PSA, there's a borderline abnormal rectal exam, again, you might want to do the testing more often to make sure that the PSA doesn't continue to rise or something is not developing. So what do you need to know? I'm going to throw some more statistics at you as well. The lifetime risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer is 17%, or basically one in six men in their lifetime is going to have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. The actual lifetime risk of dying of prostate cancer is only about 3%. So many men will be diagnosed. A subset of those men is going to have progression of their disease. And an even smaller percentage is actually going to die of it. The other thing, number four, no screening test is perfect in, for any cancer out there. And in, in my opinion, PSA testing and DRE testing, the digital rectal exam, is actually one of the better methods for screening for any cancer out there. It has better statistics than most screening tests. But it's not perfect. The digital rectal exam alone was, before the PSA testing, was very insensitive. It only picked up advanced cancers. It only picked up cancers that were in the back end of the prostate where you could feel them. And it probably missed at least two-thirds of the cancers. Many times you found it at an advanced stage. PSA testing, depending on the level of cutoff that you decide on, can be too sensitive sometimes. Um, and it's not specific, meaning there are other things that can cause the PSA to be elevated. So it might lead to unnecessary biopsies. If you decide that the cutoff level is three, which is actually kind of low, we usually pick four for younger men or even 6.5 for older men, but if you decide on a cutoff level of three, about one in four biopsies or 25% is going to have prostate cancer in it. So most men are not going to have cancer on these biopsies. The PSA can go up for a lot of reasons. It's made by normal, PS, uh, normal prostate tissue. So the density of the prostate tissue can elevate the PSA. A bigger prostate means more PSA in your bloodstream. The PSA naturally goes up as we get older because the prostate gets bigger as we get older. So BPH can do that. Normal physiologic variation from day to day. Our bodies don't produce chemicals at a steady rate. And you might just get them at that part of the day or that part of the week where you had a little blip. And you might have a slight elevation on that day. Infection or prostatitis, trauma, even a long distance bike ride on one of those little narrow bike seats might actually cause irritation and cause an elevation of your, of your PSA. Or an overly vigorous prostate exam by 
by an overly uh, anxious doctor might cause your PSA to go up temporarily. Some studies show that 20% of abnormal values may actually return to normal if you follow that same patient for up to a year. Number five, biopsies have risks. We do a lot of things to minimize those risks. We do bowel preps, we give antibiotics, we use sterile equipment, but we have to go through the rectum to do the biopsy, and the rectum is a dirty place. It has a lot of bacteria in it. For every 1,000 men screened, about 120 are gonna have an elevated PSA. Many of those are gonna end up getting a biopsy. About a third of those men that are biopsied are gonna have some sort of symptom. Blood in the semen, urine or stool, fever, chills, bleeding, swelling of the prostate, uh, infection or prostatitis, maybe even urinary retention. About 4% of the men are gonna be hospitalized because of one of those problems, because they need a catheter or they need IV antibiotics. Not big percentages, but they are real. Number six, treatment of prostate cancer. Let's say you survived that whole screening process and you're diagnosed with prostate cancer. The treatment itself can lead to problems. 90% of the men who are actually diagnosed with cancer are not gonna just ignore it and they're not gonna choose watchful waiting. They're either too anxious about it or they're young enough and healthy enough that they feel like they wanna be treated. So most men are gonna end up getting treated in one way or another. Now for every thousand men screened, not every thousand men that has prostate cancer, but for every thousand men that are screened and, and treated for cancer, two are gonna have serious cardiovascular events, such as a heart attack. One is gonna develop a deep vein thrombosis, or a blood clot in the leg that might go to the lung and cause a pulmonary embolism. 29 are gonna have erectile dysfunction, and 18 are gonna have incontinence that might be permanent and require further treatment. So those are the risks of treatment. For every thousand men that choose not to be screened, on the other hand, 60 are gonna develop clinical cancer, where it's actually gonna cause symptoms, it's obvious, it's not just something that's microscopic. Clinical cancer is gonna be diagnosed in 60 of those men within the 10 to 14 years of deciding not to be screened. Five of those are gonna die of their disease within that time period. So, to summarize, prostate cancer is a very common disease. It can have an impact on the quantity and quality of your life because of the symptoms and because you may die of it. Prostate cancer screening with PSA is not perfect, but we don't have an alternative and it may not be for everybody. And the decision to screen and to treat prostate cancer if you're diagnosed with it is a very individual decision that you make in consultation with your doctor. Thank you for listening.